Hi. Um, yeah, so my name is Ian uh, Nagoski. I'm from uh, the United States, uh, Maryland in particular. Um, everybody can hear me okay, I guess. Is that right? Good. Okay, good. Um, I'm sorry to speak English. Uh, it's all I know. But um, everyone assures me that it'll be fine. So, fingers crossed. Um, I'm a really lucky guy. Uh, I'm here uh, because 15 or 20 years ago, I got into kind of a funny habit of digging around in old, musty, crusty, dusty 78 RPM records. Um, there were groaning masses of them just kind of sitting around all over the place. And uh, I think I had some fantasy when I began um, that I would find these uh, pieces of Americana. I'd already heard uh, reissue records of blues and country music and early jazz and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, Americans have really kind of built their identities on that music as a, an antecedent, basically, to our contribution to world music culture. Which, if you were going to sum it up in four words, uh, America has contributed Charlie Parker and Bob Dylan. Everything that kind of led up to that and everything that sort of come from that, uh, we claim as like our thing. That's what we did. And, you know, on behalf of America, you're welcome. Um, so I was guessing that I might find, um, you know, jug bands and string bands from Mississippi and, you know, all these old kind of uh, uh, loamy uh, pieces of, of folkloric stuff that was part of our uh, shared story of, of who we are. And the strange thing was, you know, it just they weren't there. There were tons of records, but that stuff was kind of mostly missing because two generations of record collectors had preceded me and had gone around systemically scraping all that stuff out and squirreling it away somewhere. And so it was, it was mostly gone. Every now and then I'd come up with a little, you know, piece of this or that or something. So I just started looking at what there was left behind, what all this junk was, and um, trying to start to listen to that and figure out if, you know, is any of this stuff good? Maybe? Don't know. Uh, try it out. And what I discovered is that most of it's really bad. You know, most of it's just really, really dreadful. Um, there are many, many different reasons why people get involved in music or, or record records. The vast majority of those reasons are um, banal and goofy. Um, people are trying to uh, make money, gain reputation, you know, status, all that kind of stuff. And uh, nine times out of 10, when you drag home a box of records that you don't know what they are, and you drop the needle on them, um, your reaction is generally going to be, in my experience, Bleh! it's terrible, what is this nonsense? No wonder nobody wanted this. Of course, this is junk. This is just some trite merry-go-round of amusement that doesn't say anything at all. Well, it does, because all records, all musical performances, I think, are prayers. Um, they are all speaking to the unseen and expressing uh, what life is like, you know, what, what a person wishes for and dreams about and uh, wants, uh, what there is to complain about. That's all in there, in every song you hear on the radio. It's just that most of what people pray for is dumb. But every now and then, you know, you'd go through this box of records and it would be, no, blech, you stay over there, I'm not even going to think about you, you're getting given away or something. Next one, no. Geez, why did I buy these? Did I actually spend money on this garbage? You stay over there where you belong. Dreadful. Next one. And eventually, maybe, if you're lucky, one, two records in a box, you go through about seven seconds. I think that's about how long it takes, usually. Seven seconds goes by, and then you say to yourself, <laughs> wait, who are you? How did you get here? You're different. I like you. Okay, we're going to hang out, record. You and me, we're friends. I understand what you have to say. You're cool. You stay in this pile over here that's different. And whenever my buddies come over, that's the pile that we 
you know, listen to and talk about and think about. In the best instances, as you're going back to that pile, as you're re-experiencing those things that initially you thought, maybe there's something in here, there's something I like, something that touches me, a very special process can happen um, where you meet this invisible force in the air. Because records, these old 78s, give you almost no visual clues off the bat. Um, they're pretty much all black. There's some exceptions, but 99% of the time, it's a black disc with a spiral inscribed on it and a label um, that, in the cases of what I was buying, were in languages I couldn't read. I developed very quickly two rules for myself uh, when I was buying records. Rule number one, anything about God, buy that. That's going to be interesting because it's an unusual subject. Uh, at least, you know, during the early 20th century, um, the, the records that you would find about God were, you know, heartfelt for the most part. Um, and the vast majority of what you run into subject-wise are like patriotic songs, um, or like songs about your mother. Oh, mother, I just love you. You're so great. You're so sweet. Blech. I got nothing against my mother. I love my mother. But it's such an easy, cheap, sentimental thing to express. You know, it's just such an easy way to get people to feel something that mostly it's just ugh, this again. All right, you you're over there. But as you begin to develop a relationship with a performer and with a record, um, the sound is coming at you, and you have no image, and you know you have no image to hold on to of the gesture of the musician. Um, you have no picture of the musician in the vast majority of cases. Um, all you have is this immediate sense of the presence of them in the room, and part of you, I think, in in the best cases, leaves yourself and merges in the air with this invisible force. And I've had the experience a number of times of uh, what I would describe as like joy and wonder in who another person is and what they're capable of. Um, a sense of fulfillment that I never could have predicted even the minute before. The sense that Yes, you, there you are, just like I knew you would be. Thank you. The gratitude that comes over you and a sense of absolute trust in your own instincts and your own values and your own beliefs that this is true. This is something I believe in. I know this is right. And all of that taken together is about as close to a good description of falling in love as anything I've been able to come up with. Um, it doesn't always happen right away. It doesn't happen on the first listen. Uh, just like falling in love, sometimes it takes uh, repeated exposure and a process of back and forth uh, with the record. Hearing the record and in different emotional states um, before you begin to realize the real nourishment that that performer can give you. There's also something very special about 78 RPM records that uh, attracted me enormously because they, uh, the way they're recorded is different from the way that we're used to, uh, the, the, the kinds of recordings that we're used to listening to. Records nowadays, well, ever since the Second World War, basically, uh, have been buffed and polished and sheened. Um, recordings are their own uh, sound world that really couldn't exist in, in real time. Uh, nowadays, a band will literally spend three weeks just EQing the snare drum. Um, but how it was uh, f at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century was that there was a room. And in that room, there was some musician who sat down or uh, stood and uh, did something, played, sang, and they vibrated all the air molecules in the room with their music-making gesture. And whatever it was they did during that three minutes is pretty much exactly what you get back. The air molecules vibrate into a, a horn up until 1926, and then they flow down this horn to, at the bottom of the horn, vibrate a diaphragm. That diaphragm vibrates a needle that cuts in a spiral into a spinning disc. And then to get the sound back out, 
it's the exact reverse process. Needle vibrates the diaphragm, the di diaphragm vibrates the air molecules, the air molecules are projected back into the room, and what you experience is a um, reproduction of the air molecules in that room created by that person during that three minutes of their life, just like how it happened. And if that person was the kind of person who was capable of a moment of great grace and dignity, um, of a kind of virtuosity, either instrumentally or spiritually, during those three minutes of their life, that's what you get. You, you relive all of that grace and dignity and uh, virtuosity right there in the room that you're sitting in. The air molecules around you have that effect. And you, you know the person uh, almost immediately. There's something about them that you can connect with that's um, very, very visceral. So in the process of gathering up uh, records in foreign languages, that was rule number two that I made for myself uh, as I began gathering records. I didn't know anything about what I was getting myself into, and I would constantly be sifting through stuff that was always a new experience, and every once in a while having these kind of great, loving experiences with these records. And in the process, I wound up with some records that were in um, Turkish and Arabic that had been made uh, in the United States during the teens, 20s, and 30s. And uh, honestly, I really didn't think much about them except that I liked them. Uh, they were neat. Frankly, I probably thought they were just sort of exotic, and that was sort of cool. Um, and then something happened to me in about 2006. I was living in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, which is um, uh, a rather troubled place. Uh, half the population has left since the riots in 1968, and there are great swaths of the city that are just empty, abandoned. And um, the narcotics addiction rate is one in five adults is a narcotics addict. So there's constant evictions. There are um, always people who don't have enough money to keep their houses. And so one of the jobs you can get in Baltimore is um, cleaning out abandoned houses. So I tried to contact all of the guys who had this job. It's a real low paying job for guys who are just kind of brawny. And um, I said, you know, if you come across any records, let me know, I buy old records. And one day these guys brought me three boxes of records, uh, one of which were 78s in Greek. And because I had this policy of buying anything that wasn't in English, uh, I just bought the box. 50 records for five dollars um, and uh, yeah a lot of them were were no good some of them were really trite baloney but um, a lot of them were really pretty good and I really got attached to certain of them and looking at them carefully and uh, thinking about the catalog numbers and the matrix numbers and you know the recording dates and the studios where they might have been made it dawned on me that um, these were records that were probably made in exactly the same time and place as the Turkish and Arabic records. And in fact, the musicians probably knew each other. Maybe they shared accompanists, which turned out to be true. Um, maybe they were playing in the same clubs. Um, you know, maybe this was a scene. So I'd said that, you know, America has this sense of identity uh, growing out of um, jazz and country music and all. And we already had this myth of uh, Storyville in New Orleans, uh, kind of the red light district, and uh, these sporting houses, as they were euphemistically called, which spawned um, great piano players and, and uh, this new music, jazz, um, through the confluence of um, different people from different cultures uh, hanging out together and operating together. And I thought, what if it turns out that there's a similar kind of parallel scene of Middle Eastern music at the same time, or even preceding the development of jazz at the beginning of the 20th century uh, in New York City.